I just want to share a couple more testimonies um, with you, just to encourage you. Again, God has been working um, in our services, in our lives, and His presence has been ministering to people, healing people. Um, and even last week, uh, Ruben Fieros had shared with me that he and his wife, Michelle, and their, their family, their youngest daughter is almost two years old. And uh, she just about a week and a half ago, just over a week ago, had fallen in their home and landed on their coffee table. And there was instantly blood and in her four teeth on the bottom side, from my understanding, was were pushed back. Um, and so Michelle was going to take her to the ER, which she did. But before they left, Rubens laid hands on her and prayed over her. And by the time they got to the ER, there was no more bleeding. And all of her teeth went back to the normal position. Come on now. Come on, give the Lord a praise. He's so good and so faithful. I... Besides that being another Jesus testimony, come on, we need to break on Jesus for who he is. But the Lord wants to do miracles, not just on Sundays, but all throughout the week, outside of the four walls, people that you come in contact with, you, your faith needs to rise up and to step in faith because God's going to meet you at your faith, even for other people and other needs. And even in our homes, we as Fathers and mothers need to take a step of faith in those moments and just believe and com command for Jesus to heal whatever need it is, because the Lord is that good. Amen. Second thing I want to share with you as far as another testimony, uh, Liz Brias this morning mentioned to me that just a couple weeks ago when we were praying for healing, uh, her, knee pa her knee pain left and has not been back since. And so again, thank you, Jesus. Uh, for his faithfulness, he is our healer. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, I pray that that stirs your faith even in this moment as we jump into the word here. Um, I want to just say, first extend a huge welcome to all the guests. If you're new with us or you've been here one or two, three times and you're, you're back, we just want to extend a huge welcome to you. And uh, there's a, a Connect card that you should have received when you came in this morning. And it looks like this. If you would take a few moments just to fill that out and then drop it in the black box in the back of the room after service, or you can uh, do the digital format, which is in our app, Propel Church AZ, in your app store. You can download that, and we don't sell your information. We don't give it away either format. We just want to connect with you, engage with you, and all that God is doing here at Propel. And so, church, would you grab your Bibles at this time? And grab your outlines, whether, again, the Propel app or version app or the paper format. And if you would silence your phone so you're not a distraction to those around you. We're in this series, Non-Negotiable. Are you still hanging with me in this series? I know it's a little bit longer series, but the Lord's been doing some powerful things. And, and I, don't, I didn't want to cut it too short because I just want you to continue to grow in your faith. And I want to continue to grow in my faith in the Lord. And the reality is this, is that our faith needs to grow. It doesn't need to shrink back. And there's many in the world today that have had a faith in Jesus, and they've either walked away from their faith in Christ for different reasons, and it could be because of all the chaos in the world, and they're questioning, God, where are you, and how can you allow these things to happen? And if we keep our eyes on the world's situation from a human standpoint, we will never figure it out, and we will get frustrated even as believers. And so it's so important for us to keep our eyes on Jesus, for us to stay in the word, for us to do life together as the church. Because if we're not, if we don't have each other's backs, if there's no unity, if there's no love for one another and we're looking out for one another, the enemy wants to creep in and to try to kill, steal, and destroy our life the way Jesus said in John chapter 10. And so we're looking at that we've got to have a life of faith, which is a non-negotiable, and it's the only life that pleases God. According to Hebrews 11:6, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Church, I want to remind you again that faith is a non-negotiable in our relationship with Jesus. As we daily pursue the Lord and all that he has for us, 
And here's the reality is that sometimes we don't realize that God has more for us or that he wants to do more in us. Not only through us, but he wants to do more in us personally. Yes, we've, we've accepted Christ, but he wants to continually be doing new things in us. He wants our faith to grow. There's more that God has for you so that you experience the fullness of God and his gifts and blessings in our life, in your life personally. And today we're going to look at another aspect of faith that God desires to reward in us. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus had risen from the dead and he appears to his disciples to encourage them to reveal himself that he is alive and well. And Luke writes that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Why? Because Jesus then went on to remind them about his death and suffering that had to take place. And then his resurrection and the preaching of repentance for forgiveness of sins, which was going to happen now through Jesus, beginning in Jerusalem. And Jesus then tells them, he says, you're going to be witnesses of these things. And here's what Jesus then says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. He says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. Church, I want to I make sure that we're all on the same page as we dive in here, is that the disciples had already experienced their salvation through their faith in Christ at this point. They were already believers, and they were excited to fulfill their calling now in preaching the gospel because they saw firsthand that Jesus was alive. He was not dead. He had risen from the tomb like he said he would. Yet Jesus gave them this instruction to wait for the Father's promise of Holy Spirit and his empowerment on them for ministry. Why? Because Jesus knew that they were going to need this before they could go out and preach and minister. And so that's what the disciples did. They waited in faith for what Jesus instructed them to do. Here we see then in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, not some of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so here's what we see in this scripture and what's true for our lives also is that waiting on God for the gift of spirit baptism requires faith and perseverance. It requires faith and perseverance. Now today is Pentecost Sunday, if you didn't know. And maybe you're thinking, well, what does that mean? Let me explain why and just talk a little bit about a little bit about it and the importance of it and why it's important for you and I, for our lives as believers. Depending on your background or experience, Pentecost may mean a day, it may mean a movement, it may mean a feast, it may mean a doctrinal position or a moment, or it could possibly mean nothing at all to you. The word Pentecost originates from the Greek word for the number 50, because the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, which was also called the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, came 50 days after Passover. Keeping this in context, in that meaning in context, Pentecost was a celebration of the first harvest. Annually, it takes place 50 days after Easter. And that's the time frame that we're in today. It's 50 days after Easter, which was March 31st. The 120 followers of Christ who were waiting in the upper room that Jesus had instructed them to do, they didn't fully know what to expect, but they waited in obedience to Jesus' instruction and to his command. In unity, they earnestly sought the Lord in prayer and worship. Earnestly. We've been talking about in order to please God, we've got to believe that he exists and those who earnestly seek him, he's going to reward. Amen. 
In unity, they earnestly sought the Lord in prayer and worship. And in God's timing, Holy Spirit's presence and power showed up tangibly as we see by the violent wind that blew through the room and how tongues of fire that rested on each of them. And we know from scripture that both wind and fire are common biblical signs of Holy Spirit's activity. In John chapter three, verses seven and eight, Jesus referred to the blowing of the wind, which illustrates the operation of Holy Spirit in bringing new birth. In other words, something new that God was doing. And we know that fire in scripture symbolizes the presence of God. It represents Holy Spirit. And as Luke writes in Acts, each person had a tongue of fire resting on them to symbolize God's presence was coming on them individually, not just as a corporate entity like God had done with Israel in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. It required faith and it required perseverance from these believers to wait for the gift of spirit baptism and God rewarded them for their obedience of faith and perseverance. I wanna encourage you today the same is true for us. God desires to pour out his spirit on us individually and continually. And for our lives, we, we read about this gift and maybe we haven't received it yet. Or maybe we're questioning the validity of it. Of it. Is it for today? Is it for now? Is it for here? And I would say the short answer is yes. I've experienced it personally. I've seen it in the life of believers. And let me encourage you this, we need this gift. There's a reason and a purpose that we need this gift even in the times that we're living in. And we'll talk about that this morning. For our lives, I wanna encourage you today, if you've not received this gift yet, to begin seeking the Lord for this gift or keep seeking him if you've already begun. Don't give up, don't give up. And here's the key as we seek the Lord for this gift. Seek the giver of the gift, not the gift itself. So many times as believers, when we begin to hunger for the Lord and we want this gift, we want all that God has for us. And I hope that's where you're at today in your heart and life and relationship with Jesus as we're growing in faith that my heart for me personally as Jason I want all that God has for me. I don't want to limit God because God won't force himself in our lives or on our lives. He's chosen to work with our free will. And so we, as we surrender to the Lord and say, God, I want all of who you are, all of what you have for my life, every gift, every, ble every blessing, every bit of your favor, God, I want all of that. Don't hold back, God. And so if you're in that place and you're seeking the Lord for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, don't give up first, but make sure you keep seeking the Lord for the gift. In other words, don't seek the gift because sometimes we, we overcomplicate this process of waiting on the Lord and persevering that We want the gift, Lord. We want the gift, Lord. I'm seeking the gift. And our mind gets focused on that versus just fall in love with Jesus. As you spend time in his presence, as you spend time praying, just focus on the Lord and the Lord will baptize you in this gift. But know that it requires faith and perseverance. You have to step out in faith. Again, God doesn't force himself on us. There's many things that we have to step out in faith for in life and the Lord goes, because of your faith, now, you're, now I'm gonna pour it out on you. Just like you with healing. I still remember when I received this gift, I was nine years old, I was at an altar seeking the Lord just like we did last Sunday at the end of service and God's presence came over me powerfully and I just surrendered to his love, to the warmth of his presence and, and the gift of the spirit baptism changed my life forever in that moment as a nine-year-old. And it's still impacted me today. 
And so God wants to do the same for all of us. He wants to do the same for you. And so we've got to learn to wait on God with faith and perseverance. Continuing on in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, and then verses 11 through 13, Luke writes, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound of the upper room of speaking in tongues, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then Luke goes on to talk about the different um, language groups that were represented there. And then in verse 11, he says, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So they thought they were drunk. Of course, it was morning time, so that would have been a hangover, potentially, if that were the case. And so there were God-fearing Jews who traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, like we already talked about, the Feast of Weeks. Make no mistake, it wasn't by accident the outpouring of Holy Spirit took place at this time. It was God's timing because he was going to do a new thing. In fact, here's the point, is that Pentecost marks the day when God established his church to expand his kingdom. This is so crucial. This is why we can never forget Pentecost and what it represents. As believers, Pentecost is a holiday in which we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit on the early followers of Christ. And before the events of the first Pentecost, which took place a few weeks after Jesus' death and then resurrection, There were followers of Jesus, but there was no official gathering or movement that could be called the church. It had not been established yet. And so from a historical perspective, Pentecost was the day the church was established. But also from a spiritual perspective, as the Spirit brought life to the church, because he formed and empowered it. Pentecost, in other words, is the church's birthday. Seriously, if Christmas marks the birth of Jesus, Pentecost marks the birth of the church. If Easter marks the day when Jesus was raised from the dead, then Pentecost marks the day when the message about Jesus began to be proclaimed all over the world. Come on, you can give the Lord a hand. This is his word in truth. Understand this, church, that uniquely in Christmas and Easter, Jesus is the primary figure that people came to observe. As they came to the manger, and then on Easter as they came to the empty tomb. But in Pentecost, the church is the prominent focus. Instead of coming and seeing, it's about going and telling about Christ. Which is why Pentecost and the Great Commission go hand in hand. The whole purpose of the spirit baptism is for an empowerment to be a greater witness for Jesus. That's what we see even in Acts 1. And as followers of Jesus, being Pentecostal means living in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit because he helps us to live with an awareness of the presence of Jesus in our lives. Pentecost also helps us understand the value of the church in today's culture. Sometimes people may think the church is unnecessary and I can do this life on my own. But Pentecost, however, is a clear reminder of the truth that the church is is central to God's work throughout the earth. In other words, the local church, every local church around the world is the hope of the world today. If they believe in Jesus and they're preaching and teaching Jesus, they are the hope of the world. And God has placed them there for that purpose. And so God invites us to partner with him to expand his kingdom around the world. Going on, Pentecost indicates that God is present and is building his church through the power and unity of his spirit. Since the day of Pentecost until now, God is present and actively building his church. The kingdom 
of God is continually advancing, Jesus said, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It will not stop God's movement of building his church and his kingdom. And Pentecost also signals the breaking of barriers that separated the human race even since Babel with the formation of the church through Christ. In other words, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, reversed what happened at Bethel. If you recall back in Genesis chapter 11, at the beginning of the Bible, God's word says, the whole world had one language and a common speech. And so everybody spoke the same language. There were no hindrances in communication. Everybody could work together easily because they understood one another. And the people at that time came together in unity to build a tower to reach to heaven, to get not only close to God, but to be like God because of human pride and self-rule. And it says in Genesis 11, verse 5, that God came down to see what they were building. And he said, because they can speak the same language, then nothing will be too impossible for them. So God confused their language or he gave them multiple languages so they won't understand each other. And he scattered them throughout the earth. And that's where we get the different language groups from that point on in Genesis 11. And maybe you're thinking now at this point, well, what does this have to do, Genesis 11, and the Tower of Babel that they were building, what does it have to do with Acts 2? I want to point out some interesting parallels and differences. First, all the world came into one place for a specific reason. In Genesis chapter 11, it was to build a tower to heaven. But in Acts 2, they gathered in Jerusalem either to wait on God or to celebrate Pentecost. Second, God came down in both instances, both in Genesis chapter 11 when they're building the tower and also in Acts 2 in the upper room. And the differences and the reversals are just as interesting. In Genesis chapter 11, the people came to build Babel with one language, but in Acts 2, the Jews in Jerusalem during Pentecost heard the gospel with one language, one heavenly language. In Genesis 11, everyone left the Tower of Babel not being able to understand one another's speech. But the Jews in Acts 2 left the temple understanding the disciples' speech, which was the gospel message was preached and heard. Are you tracking with me? In Genesis 11, the Lord dispersed those into confusion, but in Acts 2, God dispersed those in Jerusalem with a unified message to their own peoples. So they would all go back to their own towns, their own cities, and their different languages, and they would communicate the gospel. In Genesis 11, the people sought to build their own building or tower, but in Acts 2, God was building his house and kingdom because he was establishing and building his church. Church, nothing has changed today except time. God's still building his kingdom and family through his church. He's still pouring out his power and presence on people people through spirit baptism, and that's why we still need one another the church, the body of Christ, and we still need this gift of empowerment called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And after the God-fearing Jews asked, what does this mean in Acts 2, when they heard the disciples speaking in their different languages, we know from scripture that Peter then preached Jesus, who he is and why he came. And he even used part of Joel chapter two, which is an Old Testament book, And it says there at the end of Acts 2 that 3,000 were saved that day. Now that's what I'm talking about. That's God establishing his church. The church's birthday. And then we see the life of these believers on a continual basis in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It says, they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's the point that I want you to take away today 
from this scripture is that Pentecost helps us to see the book of Acts as to what a healthy church looks like no matter the culture. Let me say it this way. Acts is the only historical narrative in the Bible that is demonstrating what the New Testament church life looks like. Yes, there's different elements within the different New Testament books, but Acts paints a clear picture revealing God pouring out his spirit on imperfect people, and it encourages us by showing the potential of a spirit-led living or life in every single culture, not just here in the United States, but around the world. This is what a healthy church life should look like. And so Acts is our authoritative model for church life, no matter what language, no matter what tribe, no matter what people group around the world. And the history of the church over the past 2,000 years is not a record of its evolution. Rather, it demonstrates the spiritual battle in which God's spirit restores the church to its rightful place with him. God launched the church from the beginning, fully developed on, on the day of Pentecost. It was fully developed in that moment, not as a spiritual infant that grew to adulthood at a later time. That's why we always have to go back to Acts, no matter what church we're a part of. We're a part of the body of Christ, but God gave us a plan, and we see it in the book of Acts. And since Pentecost, there have been periodic renewals in the church where Holy Spirit brought life and a restoration, but he never added new truth because we have all the truth. Because spiritual renewal is one way that God brings his church into alignment with his purposes. And so we need the power of Holy Spirit to continually work within the body of Christ. We need the power of Holy Spirit to continue to work in and through Propel. That we would come into alignment with God's plans and purposes. God has called us here in the city of Maricopa to not only be the light, but to be the truth. To be salt to the world around us. He's called us here to help others find Jesus. Amen. To transform culture that we would truly be the church because the Holy Spirit is flowing in us and through us. And that means you and I as individual believers need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit living on the inside, flowing through us in every single way. And so to experience the fullness of the fullness of what God intended for the church in a healthy way, we need to look at what Acts says and live spirit-empowered lives for the glory of the Lord. Going back to Acts chapter 1 for a moment, Luke writes about Jesus and his visit with his followers after his resurrection. And he says in verses 4 through 8, he says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Right there, verse 8. Jesus is saying, here's the purpose of this spirit baptism. For you to receive power to be my witnesses. And so here's the point is that as we look at this scripture, Pentecost reveals that spirit baptism is a separate experience from salvation. Those in the upper room waiting for this gift already had a faith relationship with Jesus. They already followed him. That's why they were obedient to him and waited to pursue this gift that he promised them. Again, they were excited that he had risen from the dead and they were ready to go and preach the gospel, but Jesus told them, you need to wait. This instruction from Jesus reveals to us that spirit baptism or baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate experience of God's grace apart from salvation. And the book of Acts goes out of its way to demonstrate the availability of an after salvation anointing and empowerment of the spirit for ministry. Every one of us are ministers for the Lord. You may not be in full-time ministry, but you are called a minister according to God's word. And God wants to give you a, a fresh empowerment 
an anointing for what he's called you to do. At salvation, the Spirit comes to live inside of us as Christians, as we see in Romans 8, 9, and we're going to read in just a moment. But after salvation, Jesus desires to pour his Spirit outwardly upon us for increased ministry anointing, as we already read in Luke 24, 49, and Acts 1, 4 through 5 and verse 8. And here's what the Apostle Paul says then in Romans 8, 9 regarding salvation. He says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives, what? In you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. For salvation to happen, we have to put our faith in Jesus. We have to confess him as Lord and Savior and confess our sin to him. Then he places his spirit on the inside of us, as Paul just talks about. And so Holy Spirit comes to live in you at salvation. And then you belong to Christ. But understand that in you is different than on you. He comes to dwell inside of us so that we follow Jesus. And the Holy Spirit molds us and shapes us, draws us close to him. And we could go on and on and talk about the many different aspects and benefits that the Holy Spirit has within our life. But on you is to be a greater witness. And whatever God has called you to in your life, in what areas of ministry, whatever spiritual gifts he's given you and giftings and abilities, God wants to anoint you and pour out his spirit on you so that you can be a greater witness for him. So that people come to know Jesus. And there's many other benefits that I don't even have time just to get into today. But I want to give you just a few here in just a moment. In addition to the separate experience, there was a subsequent need for people who had experienced spirit baptism to be continually refilled for specific situations and tasks. And even this happened to the whole church at that time in Acts 4.31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In the context of this scripture, these were the same believers who had already been baptized in the Spirit at Pentecost. Yet they experienced a fresh infilling in order to what? To speak boldly about the Lord. And I want to encourage you today, if you've already received this gift, maybe years ago, continually you and I need a refilling of God's presence and spirit and power upon us. He already lives fully inside of us. He, Holy Spirit can't fill up any more of who we are as his vessel from the point of salvation. He takes over. But there's an anointing that and power that comes on us that overflows our life to be a greater witness. So I want to give you a few things this morning that Pentecost reveals the purpose of our personal prayer language in a few different things. The first is speaking in tongues is the first outward sign of spirit baptism. We see in Acts 2, chapter 10 and chapter 19 that the recurring instances of tongues as confirmation of the baptism in the spirit. And the signs of wind and fire don't occur again in the book of Acts, but the sign of tongues continues to mark the baptism in the Holy Spirit and those in the early church. In fact, tongues became the normative sign throughout Acts that believers had experienced spirit baptism. And so this speaking in tongues was not the public gift of tongues requiring interpretation and in which was limited by the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30. But this was a personal prayer language and prophetic confirmation showing a new era of spirit-influenced speech which would mark the church moving forward. Second, Pentecost reveals the purpose of our personal prayer language as tongues empower us to worship God beyond our own abilities. In Acts chapter 2, chapter 10, and chapter 19, as well as in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 14 through 17, we see that speaking in tongues also served a purpose of adoration or praising God and declaring his deeds. While we may not always know what is being said to the Lord while we're praising God in tongues, it's clear from Scripture that praise is a key component. I can tell you from personal experience, there's moments where I feel like I've praised every, the Lord in every single way with every single English word that I have in my vocabulary. But yet I still feel like I, I need to praise Him some more and I'll just start praying in tongues, speaking in tongues in my personal prayer language 
just focusing on the Lord. And I know in that moment that I can sense his presence and power begin to come upon me. And he's being moved. The Lord is being moved himself because I'm praising him with the Holy Spirit's help in the exact way that he is deserving of in that moment. That's just one example, one way, one benefit of our personal prayer language. Moving on, it strengthens us spiritually. When you pray in the spirit, when you pray in your prayer language, you feel God's power strengthening you personally. It's different from the public gift of tongues where interpretation is needed, needed according to 1 Corinthians 14 that I already mentioned. Because the interpretation in the public context is where the body or the church is built up. Whereas the personal prayer, prayer language strengthens the individual. That's the difference. The fourth thing is it empowers us to pray more effectively for people and situations. Another purpose of speaking tongues regarding this is for prayer. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says, in the same way, the Spirit, Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So Holy Spirit knows the mind of Christ, the Bible tells us. He knows the will of God, and he intercedes for you and I, even as we pray in the Spirit. And that's why there's times where we don't know what else to pray about our situation. Maybe we've been in a trial. Maybe we've been in a problem that's been ongoing forever and ever and ever, it seems like. And as we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is praying through you in your prayer language, the very heart the very exact will of God for you, for your situation, or if you're praying for somebody else, he's praying the very will for that situation. How awesome is that? Why would we not want all of what God has for us? He's so good. He only gives us good gifts, right? And so through simple faith and reliance on Holy Spirit, you and I can go beyond our limitations in our prayer life by allowing Holy Spirit to pray through us God's exact will. In closing, I want to encourage you with Acts 2.39. After Peter preached the message of who Jesus was, and it says the crowd were asking, well, what shall we do? Because they were cut to the heart. They were being convicted. And so he told them to repent for their sins and to confess Jesus as Lord, to put their faith in him. And he goes on to talk about here the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Here's the point is that God is still looking to pour out his spirit on all who ask him for this gift. As I just read, this gift, this promise from the Lord that Jesus promised them, it wasn't just for them in that time period. Why would the Lord give this gift to launch the church and go, well, I'm going to take it away now and it's no longer valid? And even scripture also tells us, and I don't have this listed here for you, but that until perfection comes, gifts and prophecy so all the spiritual gifts will, will remain in operation. Well, when has perfection come? Or who is perfection? It's Jesus. Until he returns for the church, all the spiritual gifts, and this spirit baptism gift is for every believer. It's for today. In Luke chapter 11, let me give you another scriptural example. Jesus says to ask God for our needs in prayer and they will be given to us. And specifically in verses 11 through 13, he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil or imperfect, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Come on. Those are the words of Jesus. The gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available for every single believer 
until Jesus returns, as it says in Acts 2.39. God is waiting on you to seek him and to ask. Church, we need this gift of empowerment to be a greater witness for Christ in order to speak boldly, even in the times that we're living in. We need, we need it to do that all or everything that God has called you and I to accomplish while we're here in regards to the Great Commission. So we must seek God earnestly. We're not seeking the gift, we're seeking the giver of the gift in faith and perseverance. And God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen.